Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Shankoff. I am uh, a professor and currently acting director of our Dinner Center for Jewish Studies here at the Graduate Theological Union at the GTU. Um, welcome to this program that is actually a co-sponsored program between our Center for Jewish Studies and the Shingle Center for Dharma Studies at the GTU. We're really thrilled to be with you and to, um, and to um, sort of feature this conversation between an author and a, uh, an artist and scholar whom you will soon meet. I just want to just flag this moment, you know, so much of the discourse, uh, the kinds of programs that we have here at the GTU um, often are in the realm of theory, in the realm of historical studies, philosophical, phenomenological studies, um, and we talk a lot about narrative. <laughs> we talk about the centrality of stories in cultural life, in religious existence and culture. Um, but I'm just delighted to actually turn to the genre of fiction and storytelling today with a novel um, that really bridges some of the historical and um, spiritual interests and concerns um, that bring us to places like the GTU, whether we're here as students, faculty, or uh, guests and, and people from the broader community. So um, welcome, and I want to turn it over now to Professor Rita Sherma, the director of our Shingle Center for Dharma Studies. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you to Dr. Shankov. Um, my name is Rita Sherma. Um, I am director of uh, the Center for Dharma Studies at DTU, but also the chair of the Department of Theology and Ethics. And it's very interesting that Dr. Shankov mentions how we deal with narratives all the time. In fact, all spiritual traditions um, are based, whether they're systematic or indigenous, uh, are based on narratives. And these narratives become sacred narratives, but they become revelatory narratives. But there's a process by which the, the reader uh, enters into that text and gives it meaning, and thereby is transformed by it. Uh, it's sort of a kind of imminent hermeneutics. So um, we're, very, we're very blessed today to have with us um, Dan Schifrin, uh, who is a writer and playwright who has taught creative writing at UC Berkeley and San Francisco State University. And he currently teaches creative writing at Stanford University through the School of Continuing Studies. He has also served as writer in residence at the Contemporary Jewish Museum, where he co-curated co the exhibition Beyond Belief, 100 Years of the Spiritual in Modern Art with the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. A current Laba Fellow at the Jewish uh, Community Center of the East Bay, he's developing a play about Martin Buber and Marie Kondo and the spiritual potential of storytelling. Uh, welcome, Dan. Our, um, our guest uh, author today is Jay Chakravarti, a short, uh, you know, whose short fiction has appeared in numerous journals and has been apologized in the O. Henry Fry stories the best American short stories and have been awarded the Pushcart Prize. Chakrabarti was the 2015 a Public Space Emerging Writer Fellow and received his MFA from Brooklyn College. He was born in Kolkata, India, and now splits his time between Brooklyn, New York and the Hudson Valley. A play for the end of the world is his first novel. Welcome, Jay. 
I would like Here's to now call you. on you to start the conversation. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan. Uh, and uh, Jai, as I've been calling you, uh, and I think Jai and Jay are both acceptable pronunciations. Um, we're just meeting for the first time, which is interesting. We've talked on the phone. Um, and my first thought, of course, is always, um, right, you've written this book, which we will talk about in just a moment, in part about journeys. Um, and you're talking with people around the country, maybe even around the world right now, but sitting in your home, I think, in Brooklyn. Um, is that where you've been having all of your conversations about this book, from that seat? This is the very seat by which I have been uh, connecting with readers. Um, yeah, and it has been across the world. So I am I am grateful to the to the magic of the internet for bringing us together. And in this moment, to Professor Sharma and Professor Shankov and you, Dan, for for this uh, conversation today. Great. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna jump right in. Um, Jai, your book, uh, A Play for the End of the World. Um, is based on a really interesting historical moment in time. And uh, we were talking about how maybe the best way to efficiently bring some of those details into the conversation is simply for you to read the half page of the author's note, the beginning of the book. Um, so would you mind just starting with that? Absolutely. <clears throat> this is the author's note. On July 18th, 1942, weeks before the deportations to Treblinka, the Polish Jewish educator, medical doctor, and author, Janusz Korczak, staged a play at his orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. The performance was an adaptation of a Bengali play, Dakkar, by Rabindranath Thakur. Dakkar literally means the calling house. Nowadays, it's translated as the post office. Rabindranath wrote Dakkar in a village in India in 1911. A couple of years later, W.B. Yeats produced an English version. The play was then translated into many languages, and eventually a Polish copy ended up in the hands of Janusz Korczak, known to his children as Pan Doktor. The play is about a dying child living through his imagination while quarantined. Pan Doktor chose to stage the play to help his orphans reimagine ghetto life and to prepare them for what was to come. So um, there's a this fascinating um, kind of a transposition or translation of theater from one moment in time and one place to another moment in time and place. Um, before we go even further into uh, unpacking what happens in the book and themes that come out of it, I wonder if you could just say a word about how you came across this story. There's a really interesting origin story, which I think will also help us understand some of the themes and the issues of communication and cross-cultural revelation that I think are implied in the book. Yes, so this was quite a few years ago. This novel was a 10-year project and my wife and I were living in Jerusalem. Uh, my wife is the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. So, you know, she had this interest in researching her past. And we went to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And it was there in the Art in the Ghettos exhibit that I first encountered what I described in the author's note that Janusz Korczak had in fact staged this play by Rabindranath Tagore in his orphanage. And I became really transfixed by that cross-cultural moment. Uh, and it was a play that I was quite familiar with from my childhood. Rabindranath is a titan, of course, of Bengali letters. And I wanted to know why did a play from Rabindranath make its way to an orphanage in Warsaw? And why did it have that import? And what did it mean for that moment? And so that began my long period of research and eventually the writing of this novel. Great. Um, I think I wanna um, bring your literary voice into our conversation um, soon, meaning imminently, uh, imminent transcendence of the, of the written word. Um, will you say one more word uh, before you um, offer your first uh, reading about the book, which takes place um, in Poland? Um, can you say just a little bit more about um, how this play came to be staged um, and who 
our main character is this boy and then man named Yarek. What's what's happening to him in that moment before we get to the reading? Yes. Um, so are you referring to how did the play make its way to Korchak in the orphanage or? Um, in this, uh, in my immediate context, I'm curious about um, the beginning of the book when we we see what's happening uh, on the page. Like, what what is this what is this play? How is it being presented? Right. Um, and then what happens to this character? Yes. Uh, so this is a play that is about a child who is living through quarantine and. It is this question of how children are able to have a encounter with this idea of death and dying. And so, you know, Tagore is pretty explicit, you know, in his writings about the play is that he is really talking about the afterlife and what it means for, for a child to have an experience of the afterlife with a sense of dignity. And so, you know, I think that's one of the things that Janusz Korczak brings about in the production of this play in giving his children that same sense and that you and I have talked about, Dan, that fairy tales provide as well in another narrative context, a kind of preparation for the darkness, right? So that this, you know, sense of surprise uh, is, is muted and children can have a experience of that moment without as much a sense of anxiety and fear. Mm -hmm. And they're and they're accessing this not through so-called sacred literature, but through a work of drama. But the distinctions between the two might be more porous than we often imagine. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think of literature as a kind of empathy machine and as a kind of uh, certainly an idea machine. So, you know, to try and explain these concepts to young children in theory, I, I think is, is likely not possible, but to do so in the context of play where they are actually embodying these characters is, is, uh, is profound and, and, and also achievable. So what, so we have this, this nine-year-old boy, Yarek, who, who is in the play, who is the star of this play. Um, and then the, tell us like the play goes on and then to a degree that you can, without revealing too much about the book, um, what what happens to him, and uh, and maybe just set up the reading from for sixty miles east. Absolutely. So this play was performed in July eighteenth, nineteen forty two, in Poland, and in August sixth. So that's just a couple of weeks afterward. Uh, the children in the orphanage were gathered up and sent to Treblinka. So where the novel departs from the historical record is that one of these orphans, Yarek, who played Amal in the play, is able to escape from the train uh, and uh, is able to then go on to have a very different life. And so that's, I'll be reading a short section from that. Great, let's do it. All right. There were two windows on that train. One was covered by two bars and the other next to Madame Steffa was open. They were both just big enough for a cat to crawl through. So it didn't matter that one had been left bared. Sometime between living and dying, the train again stopped. It was the moment Yarek remembered more than any other. 30 years, he hadn't grown himself another version. Some memories were like that, bolted and nailed to the mind's eye. You could try to change them, shape them into something they weren't, but you would always be the boy with trousers that reached his ankles, the boy with the tweed cap found by Misha and given special. And the train was stopped now, who knows whether for a moment or for a longer time, and the guards were shouting because he thought someone ahead had jumped. He was holding Haim's hand, who he knew didn't have the heart to move an inch, and the heat had already burned, and he had already cried, and Pan Doctor could do nothing because he was just breathing. He thought, jump. But the rifles had colored the air outside with smoke. Still, he could see it. The window was big enough not only for Cat, but also for him. 
If only he jumped and squeezed through, except the train had started to move again. The screams had died down, the soldiers had stopped firing. He looked at Pan Doctor, and Pan Doctor winked the way he did whenever a mischief had been made, but no one was going to be told because love was that kind of secret keeping. The train had started moving again, but he saw the sun through the window that was big enough just for him. And what spirit launched his body? What ghost slid him forward? Because it was not his nine-year-old bones that did. Still, it happened. He jumped on Haim's shoulders. He pulled himself up. He went headfirst and someone he'd never know who pushed his body through the gap. He landed so softly on the sloping hill and rolled so quietly down the field with sharp rocks, holding his pain that no soldier heard. For a while, he watched the train pass, expecting others to have followed, but no one else did. Not another soul had jumped on another boy's shoulders and been pushed into the fields. Was he simply the skinniest, the fastest, or just the most daring of them in that car, the one most willing to leave the others? Now he was alone again in that field of damp and moss. He heard water nearby and he thought of Pan Doctor's face so much hope, his knees bloody with it, his left wrist bruised dark, so much hope in the wet grass under his palms that when the train gnarled away, the old trees called and he crawled his way from the light of the sun into the light of the trees. Thank you. Um, it's interesting um, hearing you read it now through the lens of like the context offered by, uh, by Rita and Sam, um, right? I, there's, a, there's a spiritual dimension even just to this that I hadn't picked up on, a kind of an escape into the light or into the afterlife with ghosts and spirit pushing him forward. It's interesting just to think about how we have these iconic images of, uh, of Korshak and these orphans walking with great dignity toward what was certain death. Um, and yet you are imagining the possibility of a different kind of life, an afterlife for, for, one, of those, um, for one of those young people. Um, the book continues, of course, and we have um, two more settings in 1972, one in New York City uh, and the other one uh, near Calcutta in the slightly fictionalized village of Golpapur. Yes. Um, will you tell us a little bit about what's happening at that moment? What is happening in 1972 uh, in Bengal, and um, and what happens when Yarak decides to visit that 30 years later? Yes, and one thing I'll say is that one of my favorite pieces of writing advice that I've gotten is to imagine what would happen if you write the next scene, mm -hmm. so that some stories you feel like you're at an end, but then try to experiment and write the next scene and see where that goes. And I feel this the way that way with this particular novel is that I think that there's a version of this story that sits only in Warsaw and is completed in that moment. But then, you know, what is the version that continues for Yarek? And that's the one that takes him to India 30 years later and the one that I was really interested in pursuing. And so what's happening in India um, in, at that time is we have the country of Bangladesh that is, that is forming. We have folks who are crossing over the border from uh, uh, East Pakistan or Bangladesh into Kolkata. We have the Naxalite revolution that's happening on, in the outskirts of Calcutta and also in Calcutta proper. So it's a very politically charged time for Bengal and India in that moment. And so when Yarik arrives in India 30 years later, he doesn't have this consciousness of everything that's happening. He's there to help stage the play that he performed in his youth. But of course, he's coming into a broader political context that he begins to discover and which affects the trajectory of his time there. Um, should we jump into when he first arrives? Yeah. And for those of us who have the book, will you remind me what page we would read? This is page 132. So this is when Yarek first goes to visit the 
village of Gopalpur, which is near Shanti Niketan, where Rabindranath originally wrote the play Dakar. Eventually, the jeep swerved onto another turnoff, which led to a hilly road. The professor leaned on the gear shift so hard that it seemed like it was his own force of will and not the crank of the engine that was moving them forward. In a little valley surrounded by small hills stood rows of huts and a field of goldenrod. This is Gopalpur, the professor said. This is where they will perform your play. This time, Yarik didn't bother to correct the professor that it wasn't his play. He was looking at the goats tethered to a barn, at a lonely cow that grazed the field. Next to the huts, there were rows of gardens. In the center was a well, a boy drew water, the squeak of the pulley against the hinge, like a long lost melody. That one knew Misha, the professor said. The people here were so curious. They'd never seen a pale giant before, and now they will have seen two. But Yarik hadn't been thinking about Misha. He'd been imagining what it'd be like to live in the country again, rise before dawn more crickets than cars, all that good work, the purpose of the day crowned in the gardens with the goats. He'd once tried to explain it to Lucy. Just imagine, he'd said, what it would be like to live like that, she'd laughed, though she came from a small town herself. For a moment, he tried to imagine her here with him, making a hut of their own. Come on, the professor called, handing him a flask of what he'd come to regard as the bitterest, darkest coffee, the taste reminiscent years later of those mornings in the mud. There's much to be done in so little time. He watched the boys struggle with his bucket of water all the way back to his hut. A woman came out to bring him back inside and Yarik saw that was nearly concealed in her sari that she was carrying a rifle in her left hand. With her right, she waved to the professor. The people here are good people, the professor said, waving in return, quite friendly. Years later, he would remember the moment when the woman with the rifle held her son's hand the glint of light that revealed the steel she kept balanced against hip. And he would wonder time and again why he hadn't at that moment commandeered the Jeep, turned it around, headed back to the airport. But he had not. He had stayed to learn of Misha's end. And Misha um, is, uh, maybe we'll just say one word about Misha because he may come back into our conversation too. Yes, so Misha and Yarik are the two survivors of the orphanage. Misha is 10 years older than Yarik, and he has a very different experience of the trauma of that time. And Misha was the one who decided that it was a really great idea to accompany the professor, who I refer to in this passage, to India to help stage the play in the village. Yarik was much more reluctant to do that, and uh, Misha passes away in, in India, and Yarek comes to take his place. Um, and this restaging of this play in India, um, to what extent is this completely your invention? And to what extent was something like that happening or could it likely have happened at that moment in time? So this was a moment in India where there was a lot of street theater that was connected with political movements. So you have most prominently Saftar Hashmi, who was performing theater in the streets of Delhi as an act of protest and actually resulting in change, you know, in certain things like workers' wages and, and that sort of thing. So this was certainly very much in the consciousness of the intersection of politics and art at the time. But of course, this, the choice of this particular play in this fictionalized village was my own. Um, I just was thinking, um, you had said something on, on Facebook about um, this issue of um, intercultural um, conversation and the, the value or the impact of art. Um, right, we were talking a little bit earlier about narratives and spiritual possibilities or the possibilities of redemption. And you're also mentioning the ways in which art, like street art, like street theater, can actually affect political change. Um, 
but you, um, you wrote something, I'm just gonna share what you wrote on Facebook as a kind of a commentary in your own work. Long before the internet or low cost airline travel, ideas were exchanged and translated from culture to culture. This is perhaps the enduring beauty of art that it finds a way across the world for when it is needed most. Uh, and this is, I uh, hope you'll join me celebrating launch of my novel, Play in the World, which at its core is about the value of art and what it means to be human despite our traumas. Um, so I, lo I love that positioning of art as being uh, something that connects people across cultures and also as a way to, um, in a way, help people, right, with trauma. Um, so my question for you is, um, to what extent did you have an idea about this? Have you always thought about art having these possibilities and let's say novel or fiction being an empathy machine? Or did those ideas emerge in response to or in concert with your discovery of this story and your writing of the novel? Are you able to, can you, are you able to pick those things apart? Yeah, I don't know if I can really pick those things apart. I think that the way I approach you know, my philosophy around approaching narrative is through a deep immersion in character and through the study of that character's movements and the kind of constant questioning of, is this something that the character would do? And through that interrogation of every movement, uh, for that to be connected to the larger questions at hand and the universal themes, rather than the other way around for this to be in interjected very directly by me as an author. Mm -hmm. Though, of course, as you, you know, read out from the Facebook post, these are issues that I feel very deeply about. Mm -hmm. But as a writer, the way I approach it is really for the characters to find their paths themselves and then for the ideas to to be layered on top of that organically. Mm -hmm. Great, that makes sense. Do you, do you have that same view in your own work, Dan, or do you approach it differently? Yeah, it's interesting. I um, <clears throat> Thanks for the question. I definitely uh, am of the idea that I wanna listen to my characters and I wanna kind of channel whatever it is they have to say. Um, and, um, you know, I think of, um, so Nabokov, um, an extraordinary writer who, um, had a position about characters and the authorial voice and agency. And it was, his phrase was something like, my characters are galley slaves and I tell them what to do, yeah. right? To the extent to which we believe him or don't believe him, or, you know, it's sometimes hard to know how to interpret what an author says when you have something so witty and, and resident like that. But let's assume that he more or less believes that. Um, I'm more on the other side where I believe that like, I wanna listen to the characters and the characters will tell me what they wanna do. And by doing that, I somehow am in a kind of deeper communion with them. Sometimes I have to be more directive than that, but I do believe that the characters will reveal something about themselves. Uh, and when that happens, I feel this privilege of co-creating something with those characters. Does that, does that make sense? Is that language? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's this language that I resonate with from poetry, which is that the poem is striving for the ineffable. Mm -hmm. And if you're going into writing the poem with a very rote sense of what it is that you want to communicate, I think it can be very hard to get to that place where, you know, you're, you're describing the thing that can't be quite put into words. Great. I have um, a series of questions that I want to run by you. Before we do that, I want to turn to uh, team GTU and see whether um, there's any questions from the audience or whatever this is called, the people that we are not seeing but who are connected with us. Um, any questions or observations that we want to seed into the conversation? I'd be delighted to hear something. Um, I'll, I'll jump in here for a moment, but I, I want to hear more of your questions. <laughs> um, we do have... Um, one question here, I'll, I'll read it out loud. Um, bringing the Indian philosophy of, I forgive my pronunciation, Abhin Avagupta's theory of rasa is spectator oriented and idealistic, emphasizing the power of the imagination, which helps the sensitive spectator to scale the heights of aesthetic delight during a performance. In Lot 
Lochana, 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 he states that Rasa Dev uh, Devani, relating to a literary work, operates through the activation of latent traces of memory in the mind of the reader. His concept of pratibha, intuition born from inspiration, as the motivating force of creativity and its development through the power of good nurturing, and as the resonance in the heart of an ideal reader spectator has given supremacy to direct experience, be in the case of religion or aesthetic experience, which for him are different facets of the same mental activity. So tapping into this vein of, of your dialogue, right now, I'm curious if that, if that brings up any thoughts here. That's why I love coming to GTU. Um, Jai, you want to take first crack? Are there, there, are there, I understood the ideas, I think, are there references there and, and thinkers and texts that you have some more familiarity with? Yeah, I mean, I, I of course, have not uh, had Obinava Gupta come up in any previous book discussion. <laughs> so I'm delighted that it was brought into this conversation. Um, yes, I, wow, that's a profound comment and question. Um, Maybe Dan, if you want to start with that while I'm still gathering my thoughts. I mean, I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. a great, great observation. Yeah, that's great. Maybe we'll, we'll circle back around. I mean, my my first thought was maybe toward the end of, of, of what uh, Sam was reading about um, the aesthetic and the spiritual being two sides of the same coin, or there are many paths to the top or to the truth. Um, I do feel like there's an intertwining of kind of narrative and inspiration um, and that journey, that artistic journey and that spiritual journey often can get wound up together, um, which is why I love the interplay of, of the two things. Um, I wish I had something more insightful to say in response to this specific text, but I'm excited afterwards to look them up on Google. Absolutely, yes. Um, I would love to see that question. If somebody could email yeah. it to me, I would, I would love to piece it together more deeply at another time. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I'll, I'll um, share just another question that, that has come in also, if I, if I may, before jumping in more, is um, um, the Warsaw Ghetto itself just has had a surprising, like a, a striking amount of art and kind of cultural, spiritual work, literature, um, theology. I mean, and I'm curious in your in your research, Jai, on this book, like if you if you got a sense of the sort of artistic cultural context surrounding this play. I mean, how exceptional was this particular moment in terms of this creative um, this creative work happening in such dark. Um, circumstances I'm curious and 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 if there was so much like how do we even it seems counterintuitive right on some level like how do we how do we understand that how do we make sense of of this kind of um spiritual cultural flourishing in in such a desolate um place I wondered about this question a lot as I was doing this research and I think about someone like Abraham Sutzkever, who was writing poems and, you know, even in one case, writing poetry in hiding and describing the experience of being in a coffin to evade the Nazis. So what are the things that we are drawn toward in these situations of peril? And Inevitably, what I find is that we are drawn toward art, we are drawn toward expression. So in going back to the Warsaw Ghetto and the performance of that play, it was very much a communal affair. So the invitation for that play was done by the poet uh, Vladislav Slengel, who was you know, a well-known poet at the time and was friends with Janusz Korczak. And there was a you know, well-known pianist there, Spielman, who for folks who have watched the movie, The Pianist, uh, that's who we we're talking about. And it was a communal experience of art. You know, I mean, Janusz Korczak was looking for a way for this not to be just a soul production, but really an 
a production where people come together and co-create that space, you know, as as we are doing now, right, in, in a kind of discussion where we're, we're lifting up the artistic sentiments uh, collectively. And that's what he was hoping for as well in that moment. Um, so I think about that. I think about a book that's very dear to me called The Unemployed Fortune Teller by Charles Simic, the poet. And, you know, there's a essay in there uh, that is about a flute player who has been sent to, to a pit and he has been sent to a pit and it's a death sentence and all he has is his flute. And initially as he begins to play, it is a very ornate composition. And over time, the composition goes from this very ornate floral type of melody to something that is much more minimalistic, that is perhaps even more primal, and yet the flute playing continues. And so I think what Simic is talking about there is this sort of essentialism in which art also belongs. And I think we see that, you know, in, in, in the Warsaw Ghetto, and that's one of the things that I'm exploring in this novel as well. Um, Jai, we, um, we talked for a second um, on our call about um, the metaphor of theater uh, and rehearsal in this book. And that's one of the things that was most striking and impressive also to me formally about it as someone who writes you know, theater as well as fiction. And right, there are places in the book where you will have a conversation between people that ordinarily uh, and other places in the book would be just exposition, but you put it in play script where you have characters talking to one another, which is kind of really interesting. Um, and even in like the scene that you read um, with Yarek jumping out of the, um, of the train, um, just a little bit past where you read, um, we kind of get this scene a couple more times, maybe three or four more times where he is imagining and reimagining and trying to kind of figure out what it is that happened. And I just was struck by this idea of how, um, right, our lives were constantly rehearsing or kind of going over a script uh, and the ways in which we're sometimes trapped in that kind of cycle. And there are moments perhaps when we can, I don't know, write our own script or do another act, or I don't know exactly how far I can take this metaphor, um, but ways in which the theater gives us a way of understanding the possibility of going above and beyond. So I'm just wondering, clearly this was in your mind to some degree, um, but to what extent were you um, thinking about those kind of larger philosophical questions relating to theater and um, its possibilities? Well, you know, I was reading a lot of modernism at the time that I was writing this book. And so if you look at a book like Ulysses, um, James Joyce is trying to get to the consciousness of his character and he's using a lot of different techniques. And finally, fairly late in the novel, we have uh, this Circe chapter in Ulysses where he finally abandons the uh, third person point of view and goes into a play form. And going into a play form allows him to access this surreal quality in the novel which then reveals things about our characters that we otherwise wouldn't have access to. So I found that to be a really profound technique because I think as writers, we are just trying to get, you know, deeper into the state of consciousness of our characters. And how do we do that? What are the forms that give us access? And, you know, one of the things this book plays around with is this fracture of memory that, we are inherently unreliable narrators. And for those moments of trauma, for those moments of significance in our life, we are constantly rewriting those moments. And what is the version of the story that we wanna to tell to our lovers, to our friends? And that version may not be the same as the version that we tell ourselves. And to be able to you know, revisit that and explore the tensions is something I'm really interested in as a writer. Hmm, that's fascinating. Even on a craft level, I, I hadn't thought about Ulysses in that, that famous section about that. And, and one of the ironies of that, of course, is that um, Ulysses, as someone who's such a like stream of consciousness and the interiority is so important to him, to, to, to move into a play script where, in general, 
we don't actually have access to characters' interiority. It's only what they say. It's kind of like a counterintuitive move, but it also reveals something about the power of dialogue. Right? Yes. Anyway, in terms of um, you know what it is that that people say and what can be read into it, and so that's that's really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, you have the dialogue and you have the possibility of the of the directions of the play, right? So this is this gives you the opportunity to bring in a kind of omniscience that you wouldn't otherwise have in the novel. So, so both the directness of the dialogue combined with this omniscience, you know, creates a wonderful way for us to, to access, um, yeah, access the characters. Yeah. Um, I, I was, with this idea of um, rehearsals and living life over and over again in Groundhog Day, I just was, I was wondering about like the karmic dimension of this. Like, what does it mean to live a life and to live it over and over again and finally free oneself of the traumas and burdens of, of the past? And I'm just, um, I don't know, I'm wondering whether there's some piece of like karma reincarnation or something that, um, is present for you in terms of some of these stories or whether those ideas animate your work or your life in any way? Well, I think it certainly animates the heart of the story, which is that Yarick feels uh, a real sense of survivor guilt from his experience in Warsaw when he was part of the play, when he was a star performer, and that he could not have, that he was not able to have the impact to, to save his fellow friends and teachers. And, you know, he was nine years old, so what could he have done? Uh, but he still feels a sense of guilt toward that. And so for him, when he gets this opportunity to go to India and again stage a play, and then it's in the context of helping to promote the cause of this village in India, you know, I do think there's a karmic connection that arises for him, that it feels like here is an opportunity for me to rewrite my story and going back to this idea of memory to even rewrite the memory of that time through the experience of what I'm doing in this moment. And the extent to which that's successful or not, um, we will let readers read the book and see what happens. Yes, no spoilers. No spoilers. I have a couple of juicy questions that, of course, I can't ask, but it's driving me crazy. But we'll we'll talk after. Um, um, there's a couple other um, kind of interesting pieces um, that I will hope to get to before the end. Um, but uh, Sam or Rita, anything else coming over the transom in terms of responses? Yeah, if I if I might relay a little more. Uh, this is just first of all, I just want to say this is such a fascinating conversation I like but if I can just throw another log on the fire here from from the crowd uh, there's a question about um, you know, the the experience as, as a writer really in the creative process of the relationship between historical research and narrative composition. You know, so many of us in this particular audience, which is an atypical audience for you, I'm sure, for a book talk on, you know, in this process, we're used to reading historical works and writing historical works, right? Like, and so staying in some ways within the genre that you're reading while you're writing. Um, it, there's interest in hearing a bit about, like, how do you how do you understand and how do you experience fruitfully like this, the connection between the kind of research dimension of writing a historical novel in this way um, and then and, and injecting that sort of secondary literature right into, into the form of, of story? Um, how do you navigate that? And, and I'll, I'll throw a question on there also, which is I was intrigued by what you said about how you were reading a lot of modernism while writing this, was that intentional? Like, did you want to write this under the influence of Joyce and other writers in that vein? Um, or is that just a coincidence? So generally the question of reading while writing and the hazards and promises of that, that interaction. Yeah, so I will say, and I'm really curious about what Dan and 
things about this too. I will say that what I read when I'm writing is very intentional and would be quite different from what I'm reading when I'm just, you know, in a period where I'm taking in. And uh, so specifically when I'm writing, I want to look at things that are breaking the boundaries of fiction that are playing with the rules of the novel and are interjecting other possibilities and other dimensions because I feel that to be so freeing as a writer. Whereas if I go back and read something that is, would be considered traditional realism, I think I would feel very much stuck into a certain room. Um, and as to the question of, you know, history and fiction, well, I'm, you know, primarily a storyteller. I you know, have not written historical fiction before this. I didn't expect to be writing historical fiction for my debut novel, but I was compelled by the story. So I suppose I'm always approaching it from the perspective of the literary sensibility and not from the perspective of presenting research. And so from the perspective of literary sensibility, the question I ask myself is, is this making a good story? And I'm thinking about story structure. I'm thinking about triangles to use the, you know, sort of the classic Chekhov term. I'm thinking about what are the triangles that are happening in the story. And then the research is really to build a sense of place and a kind of a foundation for the characters to have their experience. But the story is what comes first for me as a writer. Dan, how do you how do you feel about this question? It's nice to go second because I have just a minute to think about a complicated question like that. I think about that all the time and reading while I'm writing is always complicated. And in a way I'm always afraid I'm gonna read something and absorb it and spit it back out in the book in a way that someone will see and say, oh, you just read you know, this and now it's in your book. Um, and so there's a little bit of a weird kind of like defensive position that I have sometimes. Um, as, as, as Sam was asking the question, I had an image, this may be the best I can do in terms of really describing what this experience is like, that when I read, I don't always know what I'm looking for, but there's a feeling of warmth that emerges. There's like a moment when somehow the, the moment in time, a detail rises up to meet me and becomes alive in a way. It somehow intersects with a jet stream of the story that's already happening. And I don't know what it is or why, but I feel it happening. And I grab that piece and that ends up being like the center of it. That's what I hold on to. Um, yeah. It's a totally non-linear, non-analytical way to do it, but that's as close as I can get. I think. I love that. Yeah. So, um, Jai, I had, I had one more kind of, um, you know, module that I wanted to introduce, um, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 you know, the idea of, of theater is a big one. Um, and then the idea of what it means to kind of write for others. We talked about this just for a moment, right? Like broaching this topic. And um, it's basically the question of the complexities of writing about people who are different from us, different um, religion, ethnicity, gender, living in a different time and place. Um, and um, I, I wanted to actually bring in two quick quotes from an essay by Zadie Smith, um, which uh, the author of White Teeth, uh, On Beauty, she has a recent book of essays. She's really an extraordinary writer about these issues. Um, and I wanted to share two things really quick and then I wanted to open this up a little bit. Um, in terms of this conversation about what our responsibilities are as writers. Um, so, right, so this question of like who gets to tell whose stories um, and this line between kind of appropriation on one end and a kind of a life-giving channeling on the other, right? So like that's kind of like the spectrum and also a kind of an ethical spectrum. Um, and Zadie Smith, she, she talks about this in an interesting way. She, she talks about Walt Whitman right, in this famous phrase, I am large, I contain multitudes, um, which often we think about as giving us permission to, to be 
large and expansive and to be connected to everybody in some ways. Um, she believes that and she also cautions in a way, and this is what she says, a little bit tongue in cheek, but still I think with dead seriously, with seriousness. She said, who is this Whitman and who does he think he is containing anyone? Let Whitman speak for Whitman. I'll speak for myself, thank you very much. How can Whitman, white, gay, American, possibly contain, say, a black polysexual British girl or a non-binary non Palestinian or a Republican Baptist from Atlanta, right? So unchecked, she says, there's a certain kind of hubris that can emerge that leads to, which he quotes, appropriation, colonization, delusion, and vanity. So that's kind of on one side of the spectrum, and I love the way she describes that. But she has an alternate position, and I think this is where she really comes down on in terms of this essay and her approach. And she says two things. Um, she says, one, what insults my soul is the idea, popular in the culture just now, and presented in widely varying degrees of complexity, that we can and should write only about people who are fun fundamentally like us, racially, sexually, genetically, nationally, politically, or personalized, personally. And then she says this final thing about her second novel, The Autograph Man, and she says this, I once wrote a novel about an imaginary, multi-hyphenated British Jewish Chinese boy. Though you would know it to look at him, he's probably more like me than any character I ever created. But the question is, in what way does this like me consist? He doesn't look like me. We don't share the same gods. We don't share the same race or gender, but he is part of my soul. And fiction is one of the few places left on this earth where a crazy sentence like that makes any sense at all. Yeah. Um, so I went on a little bit in terms of like bringing this, I wanted to bring the complexity of her um, position on this. Um, I just wonder how you feel about some of these things. Like what has it felt like for you to write from, from the position of all these different people, especially someone like from a different religion? How does that, um, what was your experience doing that? And where do, you, where do you end up on the other side of that project? Yeah. So firstly, what a wonderful essay. It's in defense of fiction. I think it's worthy yeah, of reading. Right. Um, okay. And, you know, as, as we're having this conversation, I'm looking at the picture of Martin Buber behind you and you've got oh, yeah. I and it on one side and I and thou on the other. And I feel that's really relevant to this conversation as well. And which is to say that what is the experience that we as writers have with our characters, right? So are we really getting to this I and it relationship or through this process of immersion, identification, are we getting to more of this I and thou type of relationship? And so, you know, I think Zadie Smith is cautioning around this uh, mode of caricature and stereotype and so many marginalized groups have had a history where the fiction that's been written about them, not by them, is of a certain ilk. And that's all we have. I mean, certainly we've seen that with, with every group, including South Asians, with, uh, with J Jewish stories, I mean, Black story, I mean, it's every single group has experienced that. And so what is the sort of the range of diversity of voices out there in this moment is an important question to ask. What are the privileges that I, as a writer, am bring, bringing to this experience? And I have I interrogated those privileges as I sit down to write this story? And then finally, this sort of more esoteric question of, can I have this I and thou relationship with my characters? Or are there things about my own experience or my biases or my lack of awareness or my lack of context that prevent me from having that deeper engagement with the characters? That's how I think about it. Yeah, that's great. And the irony is, is that if you don't have that awareness, you won't know. <laughs> In terms, right. of, in terms of that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Sharma. Yes, I wanted to uh, just uh, bring to this reflection um, the idea of many ways in which art can act as resistance. And, you know, I this is not my er area to think about. So I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on um, 
the way that art can act as a reclamation of uh, destroyed epistemologies. So, I mean, it, I'll give you an example about of what I mean. Um, so for example, uh, you, you know, there's a book uh, which I, you know, have on my reading list, to-do list. Um, it's called The Spiritual Resistance, Art from the Concentration Camps. Um, from this, you know, from the Holocaust. And there, you know, there are many ways in which that can be interpreted and in the ways in which it speaks to pain, trauma, but also creates the possibility of resilience and resistance. But can, but can this kind of effort also be seen to reclaim, protect, um, and center destroyed or endangered epistemologies? I give you two examples. One, you know, there's mandalas painted on the mountains in Tibet by Tibetans resisting the destruction of Tibetan culture. Uh, and history by the communist regime for uh, over, um, you know, 40 years, 50 years. Um, so 60, 60 years, okay? And they, this is how, this is their way of resisting. Um, if they're caught, they would be killed. Um, a Syrian artist more recently, um, someone that I've heard of, uh, Mahmoud Haridi, He's a well-known artist, and he had to flee bombardment of his home and village and uh, home in Aleppo, and he's now in a refugee camp in Jordan. So, but he uses clay and wooden skewers to build a model of um, the ancient Roman ruins of Palmyra right, in Syria. And by doing this, he hopes to see the pieces um, that, that the residents will of, of his refugee camp will remain connected with the culture that they have left behind, with the land that they knew. So Daesh uh, destroyed the arches of the, the Roman ruins, but the Syrian artist has tried to keep it alive. Um, is that too is an art of resistance? But in what way is there a difference? And this is my uh, question in a, in a complex kind of um, question in the sense that we have to ask ourselves, when is art a kind of resistance that leads to transformation, change, resilience, and so forth? And when is art just a re reclamation of uh, a memory so that the epistemologies are not permanently this trial? Mm. What a profound question. Um, thank you. So I was reading uh, this book by Lawrence Langer called Art from the Ashes during the research for this book. And a lot of that, uh, the stories that are, that are pulled in that anthology are about the mundane. So they are about the details, the everyday. And in particular with the Warsaw Ghetto, you have a really unusual situation in that we had Emanuel Ringelblum, who was an extraordinary archivist and collected everything. Uh, this is very unusual to have that amount of minutia left over from a time that was otherwise uh, destroyed. So that is a kind of art in and of itself, this collection of the everyday moments and the mundane. And so that is a kind of reclamation of the physical memory, right? Like what were the ingredients, for example, that went into making quote unquote coffee cake is something that was preserved in the Ringel Bloom archive. So that is a kind of reclamation of memory. But then what is the art that allows for a kind of transformational experience? And here I think about, you know, what Safdar Hashmi, who again, I referred to earlier as the 
playwright, the communist playwright who stage plays in India in, 19, in, in the early 1970s wrote about. And he thought about it much more, much less in the sense of immediate transformation, but instead as something that uh, shifted the vocabulary of the conversation. So that when we're performing a play, you know, it's not going to really result in change right away, but it might change the terms in which we talk about the situation. And I think that's precisely what Zadie Smith is doing in her essay too, by the way, right? So she's reclaiming a kind of language there. So the language of cultural appropriation is a language of division, and she's introducing a new kind of language for it. So I think what art does perhaps is not so much transform, but it gives us a kind of language, a new language by which we can imagine transformation. Wow. Um, well, we are a few minutes past one. This was a, about the time that we thought we would uh, bring this conversation to a close. I, in a way, I can't think of a better ending kind of phrase uh, than Jai's in terms of that. And so um, from my point of view, um, I'd like to go out on that high note. Um, Sam or Rita, uh, any, anything else? Any like final uh, reflection um, or jives or something that you were burning to say that didn't have a chance to get out? I only I have. Say, yeah, this was just such a great pleasure. I mean, such wonderful questions. Thank you, Dr. Shankov and Dr. Sharma and the GTU and, and to you, Dan. What a lovely conversation. Those are the Thank only you. two profound words I have as well. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, this was such a remarkable dialogue um, and sort of meeting of minds and and, and artistic perspectives. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, everyone should, of course, go get yourself a copy of Jai Chakrabarti's book, A Play for the End of the World. Thank you so much to our uh, our author and our master interviewer, interlocutor. And thank you again, Rita Sherma and the Center for Dharma Studies. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon at other programs coming up with the Centers for Dharma Studies and Jewish Studies at the GTU. Thank you so much. Very grateful to both of you for coming. Take care. Take care.